heart and a stop signal to it, telling the ribosome where to begin making the protein and where to end making the protein. So all of this information is encoded in a code, a string of nucleotides that was present up here in the original gene. And of course, a long DNA molecule, say the chromosome of a, of a or one human chromosome or the genome of a bacterium, contains many, many genes. Now here's what I mean about the flow of information. What I've done here is actually to write out in shorthand form the chemical structure of a little piece of DNA. So here's a small stretch of DNA. The bases, T A C G, T A G G, just form a continuous string. And the two strands of the DNA are related because whenever one has a T on this strand, there is an A on this strand, and vice versa. And this was a, an absolutely crucial discovery that was made as soon as the double helix was discovered by Watson and Crick, that it immediately showed you how you could replicate DNA, how DNA could be the <coughs> replicative material. Because as soon as you know the sequence of this strand, just by invoking the rules A over T, T over A, G over C, C over G, and so on, you automatically knew the sequence of this strand too. So you could pull the two strands apart and then hope to make an exact copy of the two strands and in this way make two molecules of DNA. But in the process I'm showing here, we're not actually making two strands of DNA. We're going to copy one strand into RNA. And what happens when we copy DNA into RNA? A, C, and G get copied into their primary nucleotide equivalents, but the base T, which stands for thymine, is actually copied into an RNA base called uracil. Um, they're chemically very, very similar. The one difference is they lack that uracil is missing a methyl group that is present in T. But they're very, very similar. And this RNA is the material that carries the message from the DNA into the ribosome in order to allow proteins to be made. And the RNA is read by something called the genetic code, in which three bases at a time, UAC, GUA, GGC, and so on, are read along the RNA. And every time the UAC is present, the ribosome adds a tyrosine residue to a growing protein chain. So that becomes a one-to-one -one correspondence between a trinucleotide here, GUA, which codes for valine, GGC codes for glycine, UAC for tyrosine, and so on, until you come to a signal at the end which says stop translating, and then it finishes, then the protein is made. So this, in a nutshell, is how DNA makes RNA, makes protein, this was called the central dogma by Francis Crick and really has been a, a key to understanding molecular biology, to understanding the very essence of how DNA can contain the instructions for life and how it can make protein. This was all worked out by about 1966 or so. Now, if you look at bacterial DNA, bacteria are the, among the simplest organisms we know about. <coughs> Bacteria typically live everywhere. They actually account for more biomass in this earth than anywhere else. A large part of your body, for instance, is bacteria. If we look in any concrete building, after it's been up there for a few years, we'll discover there are bacteria living in the concrete. Um, they love it there. We never see them. They're tiny, but they love it there. Our skins crawl with bacteria. The air is full of bacteria. They're, they're literally everywhere. It's hard to believe that you can look out and see forests and see people, see elephants, you can see all these large animals. They don't constitute the largest biomass on this earth. It's actually the bacteria that do that. And the bacteria are the organisms we understand least. There are much more diversity out there, many, many more bacteria than there are humans or plants or anything else. And it's a very exciting field 
be working in at the moment because so little is known. But bacteria were among the first organisms from which we actually really began to understand the essence of how they worked. And a lot of the work that was done early on to understand genes, to understand messenger RNA and proteins and so on, uh, involved work with bacteria. Now we knew that in a typical stretch of bacterial DNA, we had things that I've marked here in gray that are genes. So this gray piece is a gene that encodes an enzyme. So DNA makes RNA makes protein. And in this case, we can imagine it's an enzyme that hydrolyzes lactose to give glucose and the lactose will produce energy. There's another gene shown schematically up here that encodes a DNA polymerase, the enzyme that is necessary to replicate the DNA. And so as we go on through this long list of genes that is a typical bacteria, maybe three, four thousand genes, you discover that the gene product each is responsible for some key part of the metabolism of the cell, something that makes the cell work. And if we look along this DNA, we discover that the genes are all arranged in a nice linear fashion, one after another. Typically, there's a space in between, marked here by these green boxes. And that space contains signals that mark where a gene begins and where a gene ends. And again, in a typical bacterium, there's actually not a lot of space between the genes. The genes tend to be quite crowded together. And one reason for this is that bacteria typically multiply very rapidly, perhaps every half hour or an hour, in favorable conditions, they can double, uh, make a new copy of themselves. And so anything that is carrying along a lot of waste that would slow it down just doesn't double as quickly, and so they get left behind. And natural selection takes care of them. They disappear. So there's been a great selection to really keep everything as efficient as possible, and not to carry a lot of garbage around. Now, when I first moved to Cold Spring Harbor in 1972, there was a little bit known about what was going on in terms of genes and the signals that were controlling them. But everything that was known had all been worked out in bacteria or in viruses that infect bacteria. And we knew that, say, human DNA or the viruses that interact with human DNA were really quite different from bacterial cells in many ways. And I became interested in the question of whether the signals that control genes in adenovirus were the same as the signals that control genes in bacteria. I think if you asked almost anybody at that time, do you expect there to be differences, they would have said no. And so, in a way, by doing this, we, we had some preconceived notions that we were going to find the same kind of answers in higher organisms, particularly in adenovirus, that we found previously. But nevertheless, being a scientist, one always wants to know um, whether things are the same or whether things are different. And of course, if you're like me and love finding new things, you always hope that there'll be at least a little something that is different. In order to pick a system that we could work on, we chose agnovirus. Now, agnoviruses are small icosahedral viruses. Almost everybody in this room will have been infected by an adenovirus. Maybe when you were one, two years old, your mother thought you had just developed a cold. All of the symptoms are the same as those of a common cold. Two, three days, you get over it, and you build up an immunity to adenovirus, and you never get infected again. It's just one of these transient viruses comes through, is uncomfortable for a couple of days, and then you develop antibodies and become lifelong immune. But it turns out it's a very nice virus to work on experimentally in the lab because we can grow it rather easily. We can take tissue culture cells, human tissue culture cells, put adenovirus in, and it will replicate, it will make lots and lots of itself. And it has one very nice advantage, is that when it does infect a human cell, 
early on, it turns on a set of genes, and those gene products then stop all of the normal human cell activity. And essentially, the human cell becomes full of messenger RNAs that are encoded by adenovirus. So normal human messenger RNAs will sort of slowly disappear, and by a few hours after infection, you only see messenger RNAs that are being made by adenovirus. And so we have a ready supply of lots of messenger RNAs. What we knew about adenovirus prior to 1977, which is, um, well, actually we started this work about 1975, but prior to um, our discovery, what we knew was that uh, the left-hand end adenovirus, I should say, is a DNA molecule. It's a band almost 40,000 base pairs long. But on the left-hand side of the genome, there were a bunch of genes that we call early genes. And these were genes that as soon as the virus went into the cell, it started making messenger RNA corresponding to just this little segment of the left-hand end of the genome. There were a few others too, but these were the predominant ones. Later on, when the virus had managed to replicate itself and started to make new viral particles, it needed a lot of proteins to package itself into the appropriate pot, um, coat. And these are all the late genes shown up here, and we knew there were quite a lot of late genes. And all in all, as a result of some pretty crude experiments that had been done, we had the idea that there must be somewhere between 15 and 20 genes that were present in our virus. And so we thought that what we would do would be to try to find one of these genes that we could characterize in detail and understand exactly how it was regulated. So here's the idea. We want to find one adenovirus gene. <coughs> this is the gene here that is making RNA. This is the start point where the RNA is being made. What we were especially interested in was to know whether this sequence that precedes the start point of the RNA, we call it the promoter, but this is the regulatory sequence that tells the polymerase, hey, start making RNA at this point. We wanted to know what was the sequence of the bases just up here, so that we could then compare that sequence with a sequence that were known to be present in bacteria. So there were several promoters for bacteria now. We wanted to know if the adenovirus promoter was the same. Now you'll remember I just told you that adenovirus is linear. And we knew that the first RNA that was made when adenovirus first infects a cell starts at the left-hand end and goes in. And so we thought the thing to do would be to isolate a little bit of this RNA. We'll determine the sequence right here at the start of the RNA. Because the DNA, this is actually the end of the DNA right here, we thought all we would need to do would be to determine the DNA sequence coming up through here, see where the RNA began, and then by definition, we would know the sequence of the DNA that was the promoter. Very simple idea. We sequence the end of the RNA, we sequence the DNA leading up to it, and then by deduction, we must know this must be the promoter up in here, and we could compare it to the bacterial sequence. Well, when we tried to do that, we discovered that when adenovirus first infects cells, it doesn't actually make a lot of RNA from this early promoter. It only makes a very small amount, and not enough that we could actually isolate it and work with it in order to determine its sequence. Now, part of the reason for that was that we were working back in the 1970s, and the techniques for doing this were just not as well developed as they had been previously. Today, probably could do it. Today our techniques are much better and we could do it. But back in the 1970s, the techniques were not far enough along to allow us to do that. And so what we did instead was we started to look late during adeno infection. Because we knew that late during adeno infection, almost all of the message being made in the cell was in fact <coughs> made by um, adenovirus, it corresponded to adenovirus messenger RNA. So let's go back to this slide. And so what you see here is that there were all of these late genes, and I say in total we thought there were probably 15 or 20 of these, 
So we thought, well, let's characterize and pick one of these. Let's say find the one that there is most of, and we'll study that, because there we should be able to get enough material. And then when we were thinking about the methods that we were going to use in order to actually characterize the message RNAs, an interesting discovery was made in several different labs at the same time. And that was that at the start of these messenger RNAs, there was a very special chemical substituent that was put right at the start. It was called a cap structure. It contained a guanosine residue in a funny orientation, and it had three methyl groups on it. That turned out to be a very nice biochemical marker and we quickly came up with a, a scheme that would allow us actually to look at just the very end of the messenger RNA and to purify just the very end of the messenger RNA from a huge mixture. We could take all messenger RNAs and using this technique that I devised, we could catch just the start here. And so we thought the experiment to do would be we would take all of the messenger RNA from adenovirus cells, we would catch all of these five prime ends, and then look at them. Uh, there is a method that was developed in Fred Sanger's lab in England. Fred Sanger won the Nobel Prize many, many years ago. In fact, won two prizes, but one of them was for DNA sequencing, the other for protein sequencing. He had developed a method that was very nice for separating out pieces of RNA. And we thought that by doing our experiment, we could actually follow what was happening to all of the individual messenger RNAs all at once. We expected that we would find 20 spots. We thought we could separate them in a very nice way and monitor each one individually. And then the one that was strongest, the one which there was most, would be the one that we would do our promoter experiment on. Well, I was working at the time, I had a, an excellent postdoc who had come to me from Harvard called Richard Gelinas who was doing these experiments. And so I set him to do the experiment. Well, he did it. It worked beautifully. But when he looked at the answer, instead of seeing 20 spots, there was just one. All of the messenger RNAs that were being made in adenovirus seemed to have just one cap one start, one kind of starting point for all of the messengers, even though we knew that the messengers were scattered all over the genome and one expected all the sequences to be different. Well, of course, as a typical supervisor, I said, well, you know, Richard, you just better go and do that experiment again because you must have done something wrong. And so he went back and did the, did the experiments again and I guess was a little more careful the next time around, but still got the same result. So as with all supervisors, I immediately said, well, look, you know, why don't you go and sit down and I'll do the experiment. I'll show you how to do it properly. So I did the experiment and I got exactly the same result. Well, and of course, at that point, now I believe the result. <laughs> so here we were, we had an unexpected finding, um, something that really didn't make sense. We were convinced experimentally that we had done everything properly, but of course, you talk to your colleagues about this sort of thing, and you know, they, they knew what was expected, and they knew it shouldn't look this way, and so they tell us, oh, you must be doing something wrong, your technique can't be right, and no one would believe the result. Now, for someone like myself, there is nothing, and I repeat, nothing that makes me want to do something more than for someone to say, you've done it wrong, you shouldn't be doing it this way, go and do something more productive. So, Richard and I then spent the next year trying to prove uh, that the result we got was genuine and to try to understand what it meant. <laughs> the bottom line, and if I can really put it clearly, the bottom line, as we were looking at the experiment, said that whatever was sitting at the end of this message, and whatever was sitting at the end of this message, whatever was sitting here and here, they were all the same. Now there are two possibilities. One possibility is that this is added in some separate way, so that 
this piece of sequence of the end here comes from just one place and gets added to the RNA, or the sequence is repeated at many points in the genome. Well, it turned out another postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory, uh, a young Indian woman who was extremely talented, Sajid Zain, was looking very carefully at just one of these, actually this one, a fiber message RNA, and she showed convincingly that in the DNA sequence up here, this sequence that we were finding at the end of all of the messages simply wasn't present on the DNA. So here was one example of a message that didn't have the sequence at its five prime end. Whereas all of these other messages, um, by our analysis, were due to and I, it did have that sequence there. So this led us to speculate that what must be happening is that the sequences at the end of the message were being coded at one place on the genome, and the messages were scattered elsewhere, and that somehow a mechanism existed to join the two together. Now this was a radical suggestion, it was against everything um, that the dogma would have you believe. It was totally different from the way the bacteria made message. And yet the more experiments we did, the more we liked the idea that this must be what was going on. Now let me show you a picture. To give you an example of just one experiment that we were trying to um, interpret uh, and that helped us in our thinking. Normally, if you take a single strand of RNA and a single strand of DNA, where the DNA is, is, is the region that the RNA has been copied from, you can actually mix the RNA and the DNA, and they will form a nice double-stranded structure called a hybrid. And the process is called hybridization. And what happens is that in a typical messenger RNA, you get complete hybridization here, except at the three prime end, the right hand end of the messenger RNA, where in higher cells, there's an enzyme that has added a whole string of A residues. It's called poly-A polymerase, and it's put there after the RNA has been made in order to stabilize it. We thought that what must be happening, that there must be a similar sequence up here at the five prime end of the RNA, that had gotten on there by some process that we didn't understand, and that it too was not hybridizing next to the DNA. This was the explanation for Saeed Azade's experiment with fiber messenger RNA. And so we reasoned that if this in fact was the case, let us say that a typical RNA had sequences at both ends that were not coded on the DNA, then we should be able to detect them. Now it was already known that if you had this long poly A stretch of the three prime end, you could actually make synthetically a long stretch of poly T, remember A and T hybridize to one another, and you could take that stretch of T and attach it to a very big molecule that you can see in the electron microscope. And in this way, you could in fact find these sequences where the poly A was. And so we argued that we could make a long DNA molecule that was complementary to this five prime region here, we could also make an electron microscopic marker, some marker that would tell us where this was. And we had an idea of what that, that molecule should be, and because I come up with a theory which turned out to be totally wrong that one of the small RNAs being made by adenovirus might be the source of this particular RNA molecule. Well, the idea for this experiment came one Saturday morning. After about a year's worth of work that Richard Gelinas and myself had been involved in, and which had really gotten us a lot of data, but had not led us to the, the experiment that would really prove what was going on. And we would gotten into the habit of we work all week and then on a Saturday morning have a post-mortem to sort of try to understand why the previous week's experiments hadn't worked or at least had not shown us what we wanted them to show us. And so we would on the Saturday just brainstorm and try to find 
the experiment, the, the thing that would prove to the world that what we've been saying all along really was correct. And it was this realization one Saturday morning um, that just came to me out of the blue. I had no idea where the idea came from, but Richard was up at the blackboard and he was proposing some very convoluted and complicated experiment. And I guess I wasn't paying attention. And then all of a sudden I said, aha, I know how we can do it. And so this was the thing. I basically drew this on the blackboard. And I said, what we need to do is to find the piece of DNA that will hybridize here.